This is Axon from Vichara, the first commercial single board computer that's designed here in India. With an impressive list of specs and features, it's easily one of the most powerful and power efficient ARM SBCs to come out this year. And I have managed to get my hands on one of the first few units ever shipped out. It's a ton of fun and I can't wait to share all about it. You ready? Let's dive in. Axon came in a simple package with a USB-C cable and wireless antennas. It's built around the RK3588 system on chip or SOC, which is a fascinating little monster that deserves its own entire deep dive video, but that's not today. The board is larger than a Raspberry Pi 5, roughly the same size as a Jetson Nano and very similar to a 2.5 inch hard disk drive. It has I.O. ports practically all around it, but only the front and right hand side contains the consumer facing hardware connectors like USB, HDMI, etc. We can see the two stacked USB-A 2.0 ports and the solo USB-C port at the corner, which is the power delivery input port. There's a gigabit Ethernet and a Wi-Fi Bluetooth module for networking. And on this other side, there are three micro HDMI ports, one of which is an HDMI input port. More on that later. And right next to it, there's a 3.5 mm audio combo port. There are also breakout headers for audio right beside it. The board has a 30 pin GPIO header. The small JST header right next to it is for RTC batteries. You can fit in a Raspberry Pi RTC battery module there. Moving on, there are four physical buttons for boot, reset, power and recovery. The antenna ports of the RF module are also around that spot. You can connect the two antennas that came with the package. On the last edge of this side, we see the two pin fan header and the M.2 NVMe connector and EMMC chip right beside it. Turning the board over, we can see the main SOC in aluminum bikini at the middle with the supporting cast of DDR chips by its side. Among the connectors on this side, there are two USB-C Gen 3.1 ports with support for DisplayPort Alt mode. A microSD card slot and two FFC connectors, one wide and a narrow one. The narrow one has some teeny tiny 5 volt and 12 volt JST headers right next to it. Now, let's go ahead and connect this USB cable to power it up. The onboard MMC comes preloaded with Ubuntu 22.04 LTS using the Mate desktop environment. So that's pretty convenient to have the board ready to boot right out of the box. And as you can see, the boot process is swift and it takes us directly to the desktop, skipping the login screen. I was so impressed with the startup time that I looked into it and found that the system just took 15 seconds to boot. But realizing it could be even better, I further optimized it down to under 7 seconds. But I would advise against messing too much with the preloaded OS on the EMMC. Because you see, Vicharak has pre-built images you can download and flash onto a and flash onto a micro SD card and boot from it. I can even attempt a release upgrade and even if it fails flat on its face, I know I can still boot into the board from the other media. But because it didn't fail, flat on its face that is, now you are looking at the first person to run Ubuntu 24.04 on this board. I love this. I'm documenting all my findings in the board reviews GitHub repo. You can follow it for more detailed and up-to-date information. You can find the link in the video description. Next, let's talk about the power efficiency. We know that RK3588 is an incredibly power efficient SOC. So it practically doesn't get hot due to casual use. Temperature is pretty well within tolerable range. That's the crazy thing about this is that I was not convinced those flimsy heat sinks were sufficient for running the board. But turns out it is like basically the board seeps power. It's so power efficient. The highest power draw spikes up to 10 watts, but during normal operations, it barely reaches 5 watts and it stays around 2.5 watts for the most of the time. So, after making fun of it initially, I eventually came to terms with that flimsy looking pre-applied passive heatsink that doesn't even cover all its private parts of the SOC. So I don't really need to apply a bigger heatsink. But I was planning to push some limits, so I gave it a makeover anyway. 
and then I ran synthetic benchmarks to see how it fares. Previously, even Sysbench was pushing it to 45 degrees centigrade, but with the new active cooling upgrade, even Geekbench 6 couldn't get it to 45 degrees centigrade after practically burn testing the CPU for 10 to 15 minutes straight. It kicked ass on Geekbench 6, scoring over 3000 on multi-core benchmark even with a passive heatsink, miles ahead of an active cooled and overclocked Raspberry Pi 5. But that was the first unit I tested. I had to return it since and the second unit I got turned out to be an unlucky draw of the silicon lottery. It took it a lot more effort and the active cooling upgrade to push it past 3000 points, but it's still way faster than a Pi 5. Now, that's all well and good for the main CPU, but let me introduce you to the other members of the racket, like the GPU. It works somewhat. You can run some benchmarks, get confusing capabilities and app crashes, etc. And then realize even Chrome is able to use it partially. So at least there's something going on. The problem isn't really with the hardware. The software is actually what sucks and it's getting better but we're just not there yet. So I asked the same question that any level-headed gamer would ask in a standoffish situation like this. Can it play Doom? And guess what? It can. So I dropped all the allegations and moved on to the next heavyweight in that ring, the VPU. Our mesoses generally have a video processing unit as a dedicated video transcoding accelerator. And the one on RK3588 is quite a beast at that. It's called RKMPP and if utilized well, it's hands down the most cost effective video transcoder in my experience. The Jellyfin team can stop singing its praise and quite justifiably so. I'll show off the different use cases of this hardware accelerated transcoding in a future video. Subscribe so you don't miss it. Last but not the least, the NPU or the AI accelerator. For rock chips, it's called RKNN and getting it to work is quite a chore. Find the scripts in the GitHub repo. Once set up, it will give you six tops of int 8 performance with highly quantized models. During the live stream, I ran Olama with 1B parameter Llama model on the CPU and I was pretty happy with the result it gave. But if you are curious, how does it work using the NPU, then again, you will have to wait for the video on the application of this board. Now let's move on to check the disk IO of all its storage interfaces. First off, the integrated EMMC is quite performant. 304, that's, that's insane, that's good. For EMMC, that's actually really fast EMMC. The micro SD card slot is supposed to operate at UFS 1 speed, but it barely pushes past 20 Mbps read and write, even with cards that are clearly capable of much more throughput. Not sure what's up with that. But on the bright side, the M.2 NVMe interface using 4x PCIe Gen 3 lens can reach a speed of 4 gigabytes per second. But most often you will be limited by the SSD that you are using it with or the file size to test it with. All of these are very acceptable performances. And even if you are running off of the EMMC, the storage speed is not going to hold you back. Next up, we have the network interfaces to test. The SOC has two gigabit Ethernet support, but only one of them is broken out to a connector. It's a choice that was made because of a reason that will forever be unknown to us. The wireless Bluetooth combo module uses SDIO 3.0 to interface with the SOC. And even though some people had issues with the Bluetooth, the Wi-Fi connectivity didn't give me any pain. So hopefully I think, yep, I'm connected. This is awesome. It worked right out of the box and was an absolute bliss to work with. Axon has on board a total of 8 high speed connectors that are not regular consumer peripheral interfaces. They have their own pinouts and the adapters to connect them with off the shelf devices are still being cooked hot in the oven. When I asked about it, Vicharak sent me a CSI adapter which is supposed to work with Raspberry Pi V1 camera modules. But the documentation is still very sparse and the adapter complexity is an unnecessary hassle to get it to work. So these connectors and their interfaces will have to wait their turn for the application video if I get them to work by then. The board supports a ton of display peripherals from HDMI DSi to DisplayPort, two of each. 
This is also the first SBC to single cable drive my 4K 60Hz portable display at its full potential. And that's super cool. What's even cooler is that Axon even has an HDMI input port. Yep, that's an integrated 4K 60Hz capture card. Now, trying to test that capture feature was a bit of a long winded road, but that's not because of the HDMI input port. I've explained the current challenges in detail in the GitHub repo, and this is hands down my favorite feature of the board. And I want this to work as soon as possible. There's one last thing to check out and that's the audio interface. Initially, the HDMI audio wasn't working, but that was promptly fixed and the other option, which is my favorite, is to use the 3.5mm audio jack. But that's not all. There are also audio headers broken out. And as a DIY enthusiast, I am extremely happy about it. So despite the stacked layers of software issues that are pretty common for any new devices in the ARM ecosystem and some of the design choices that are hardware specific to this particular board that I didn't quite drill down in this video, I'm overall pretty satisfied with Vyas. I mean, Vicharak Axon. Its power efficiency, transcoding capabilities, wide array of interfaces makes it a really good contender against even the flagships like Raspberry Pi 5. And its onboard peripherals like EMMC, the 4K capture card, the NVMe interface, display port over USB-C, those easily cover the difference in price. And yes, I know there are things that could be better like a better thermal solution, better distro and driver support, better documentations. But hey, that's something that at its worst at this moment and uh, it's only going to get better over time. But that will take active support and participation by the Vicharak team and a ton of software updates and bug fixes to make it happen. Playing nicer with the open source community, allowing people to contribute, putting out better docs, um, sharing video guides, educating users about actual implementations of the use cases and not just the demos. Those are super important to that end. And from what I've seen so far, they are indeed walking the walk and not just talking the talk. The Discord is active, the Discourse forum is now live too, and the GitHub also has some useful nuggets. These are all good stuff. Vicharak CEO Akshar even showed up during my live stream both days and interacted with the chat. The engineers from their team helped me understand the software issues and often made changes as soon as I mentioned them. And when I complained my board had an issue with USB-C ports, Akshar readily swapped it for another one. He was super transparent about what happened to it and I really, really appreciate that. So for Axon as a device, it's a good start. It has come a long way and it has even longer way to go. And when it comes to its community and customer friendliness, which are a get straight A's from my side. So that's it folks. Please like, comment, share and subscribe. All right, I think that's the cue for most people to click off the video. So if you're still watching, then there are a couple of things that I want to share with you. First off, Internally, we really debated whether to make this video. Uh, this doesn't quite fit into our general vibe of, hey, I made something cool and uh, you can do it too. And so far we have kept ourselves from making hardware review videos. But at its core, our channel's goal is to encourage young makers everywhere, but especially in this subcontinent, to build, to make, to manufacture. So when you saw it that way, it kind of made sense to do a review of a locally designed hardware and we went for it. Let us know in the comment below what do you think of it. Um, secondly, videos like these take a long time to make, a really long time to make, especially the editing part. When I have already mentally moved on to the next project and this is no longer holding my interest, and I am reaching a critical point in the project bottleneck where I come up with new ideas pretty much on a daily basis, but I only get to present them on a quarterly basis. And that's not good. So I have a lot of projects in half done, undone, semi done pro state, and uh, I want to somehow clear those backlog. So I'm looking for a video editor who can take that off of my plate. And so we can make more videos on a more regular basis, hopefully. But until then, I have started live streaming every Sunday, 8.30 p.m. IST. That is 3 p.m. UTC where I show off and tinker with whatever the tech or gadget or projects that I find interesting that particular week and clear up my backlog that way. So please come drop by and say hi. I really love interacting with the chat and uh, answer your questions live. 
um, i hope to see you there thanks for watching and break it till you make it